And so here we go. We're starting. So um, this is a, a class that is dedicated to the new Christians and the Anusim. The Anusim means the coerced ones. And this is a, really about trying to figure out what, did it, what was it like to live in this scenario. If you took the cross, if you converted, what was your, what was your inner life like? And so that's our that's our subject um, for for today. The quick recap of what happened um, in the last lecture: important facts that you need to know. So the important date to remember is 1391. 1391, Ferran Martinez. He's this sort of um, populist preacher, and he foments hatred against the Jews, and that sparks riots, pogroms, mob executions. And Jews have only one way to save their lives across Aragon and Castile, and that is to convert in mass. This is the first time in Europe, or really in any scenario, where you have a massive number, whole communities, literally hundreds of thousands of Jews who take the cross to avoid violence. Now, it's not the first instance of conversion in Europe, but it was one of such unprecedented size that it creates an entire cultural phenomenon in its wake that affects both Christians and Jews. So what we're going to focus on in this particular episode is the internal life of the converso. What were the internal and external features of life? How did they preserve their Judaism? How dangerous was it? What was the social religious environment that they lived in? And so our first pass at this is going to be a little bit of a shocking one, but I think it's important to share um, at least who the historians are because they, um, they, they dovetail with our lives here today. So the first of them is Benzio Netanyahu, who, yes, is the father of both Bibi and Yonatan Netanyahu. He writes a number of books on the subject. This is his area of expertise. Um, the one that I actually had in my library, there's another one on its way, should arrive on Friday, um, but it is The Origins of the Inquisition in 15th Century Spain. Um, and the book's uh, dedication is uh, worthy of just taking a moment to be distracted by. This book is dedicated with unrelieved grief to the memory of my beloved son, Jonathan, that's Yoni Netanyahu, who fell while leading the rescue force at Entebbe on July 4th, 1976. So uh, the Netanyahu family is a family which is obviously very um, familiar with, with violence against Jews, with coercion, with all sorts of uh, enemies from without, um, you know, whether in the pages of history, whether in the battlefield, or whether in the prime minister's seat. So this is a, you know, just an interesting, um, it's an interesting nexus point. But what does Netanyahu say? Netanyahu is going to tell us something that we don't like hearing. And Netanyahu's point is that the vast majority of Jews succumb to the forces of coercion and become full-fledged Christians to the tune of hundreds of thousands. Netanyahu, he's not the only voice in the historical perspective, but his version of, of this history is a very, very small minority really became conversos. Most of them just went wholesale into Christianity. And the question is, why does he say this? So the answer that he says is, look, if they adopted Christianity under duress, of course they were likely to return either in secret or openly to Judaism. But most of them were reluctant to stop performing all of the commandments. You know, they were still holding on to things. People just don't change that quickly. But here's what happens. You have these riots in 1391. And after they returned from the baptismal font, they found their homes desecrated and looted and their sources of livelihood gone. That the, the, the mob had just completely the Jews lived in ghettos they lived there was it was called the Juderia they lived in these little neighborhoods and the, the mob just came in and they took everything and they took their property they took their tools they took everything that was could make a living was worth selling all of it and and also one of the things that always happens in these riots in every location is that they burn the loan documents now don't forget that the Jews, are the money lenders and the tax farmers. So of course they're the ones who've got the documents for who owes what to whom. And so those get burnt. And so this leaves the Jewish community in a financially destitute, literally starving position. 
remember there's no there's no government welfare office there's no food stamps there's no uh there's no uh you know uh toledo um food bank that those things just don't exist and so this required them to um and to forced labor um to long work hours they had to spend most of the day in christian neighborhoods they eat to non-kosher food they had to work on shabbos and it just became harder and harder to go to that secret minion down the block and so basically there was also a heavy pressure from both the church and the new christians in other words the jewish apostates to fully adopt christianity so netanyahu basically builds this picture based on on some sort of external facts a little bit of logic this is what must have happened in those that first aftermath how did most people survive right there, there was no way to survive and so the only way they could do it was to fully adopt christianity but he also has a couple of historical sources um, that back up his position. And one of them is a book which we have in our possession. It's called the Maasei Ephod. And it is written by a very interesting person um, whose Christian name would have been Profiat Duran. But his Hebrew name was Yitzchak ben Moshe. And he lives from 1350 to 1415. He's a student of a very prominent rabbi of Chazdai Kreskas. And he, he also himself was at one point a, a, forced, a forced convert, but he manages sort of to come back into the fold. Maybe his forced conversion was of the nature that the church recognized that it wasn't really free will. They didn't hold it against him, but he came back. And Chazdei Kreskas um, convinces him that it is, it's his responsibility um, to... to help persuade lots of these conversed, converted Jews to come back to the fold. Um, but you're going to see that he has, um, he meets with a lot of reluctance. So he writes, part of them display a reluctance to return to Judaism as if they have already left the nation that Hashem has chosen. Right? That these people pretend... I don't remember what Jew, what is that Judaism thing? Who's Moses? I don't know anything about Moses. I only know about the guy on the cross, right? So he was saying that, you know, they're, they're, he's going out to try and teach Judaism to them, but there's this great reluctance to, to return. He even uses even harsher language. He summons a, a phrase from the book of Jeremiah. It says, Ra'atichi az ta'alozi. For you exalt while you're performing your evil deeds. He's looking at these these Jews who are going to mass, who are uh, are baptizing their children, and he's like, "How are you guys so joyful in all of this?" But some of them were, and this is a, a admittedly it's reading into this, but it's not such a hard read, right? Lots of them may have been kept out of the uh, of the the carpenters guild or the blacksmiths guild, and now finally they're allowed in, and it's like fantastic. I. I can take in, I can take out membership at the country club, right? I'm finally allowed in. Now we'll find out later that that may not have been entirely true when there was the, there were good, uh, the good old um, uh, deep seated racism toward the Jews also applied to the new Christians. But at, don't forget, we're in the first 20 years of this, 1391 till about, um, about 1421, first 30 years, things take a little while for people to get used to, to see where things are going. And at this point, a lot of these Jews are like, finally, the, the keys to the castle have been put in, on the table and they take them up with great joy. And Duran says, wow, how can they do this? In another place, he says, this is what we have to do. For them, we must make right and stir their hearts to, uh, it should say, to return to Hashem. Um, and he and others are going to write treatise after treatise, Chazdai Kreskas. They're going to write treatises over the centuries to try and, and bring the Jews back to the fold. But the way that Netanyahu understands it is if they had to write these treaties all along, it means that it was very hard to get those Jews to come back. Let's add to that that he also mentions that there were many apostates themselves who were some of the chief agitators. Last In our last episode, we 
we um, uh, we saw one of them, Paul of, of Burgos, um, the this the the rabbi who became the the bishop, and they would write these polemics and they would go hard and they would force the Jews to go to sermons and and they would go into the synagogues and they would give conversionist sermons and as time progresses this becomes even more and more aggressive and Netanyahu assumes that the the agitating new Christians the people who really wanted to climb the ranks save their skin who wanted to advance themselves were so many that they could easily overrun simply by sheer numbers the the new converts and they could make heavy inroads within this sort of wavering new community of people who had taken the cross but really in their heart they were Jewish they you know if you pardon the profession the the expression but you know they ate kichel and herring I know they didn't they were Spanish Jews but they they had this sort of pintal yid they had this this Yiddish sense but now they were Christians well this was a sort of a a, a time of flux and there was a lot of aggressive new Christians, meaning former Jews, who went in there and tried to proselytize and move the crowd into being full-fledged um, um, uh, Christianity. And again, Netanyahu assumes the fact that Jews tried to write so many treatises arguing why Judaism is true and Christianity is false meant that it was they were they were constantly losing the battle. Now, there might be other ways to read that, but that's Netanyahu. Now, there are other voices who express a different history. One of them, and I'll pause here to tell you a little bit about this historian, um, Rabbi Simcha Asaf. Rabbi Simcha Asaf is a student of the Telshi Yeshiva, and he loves law, and he's an autodidact, and he, he is, uh, learns um, Roman law and French law and British law, and then he comes to Israel and the Hebrew University needs somebody who can teach rabbinics. And so here's this guy, Simcha Asaf. He's got no university degree. He's got no PhD, but he knows his stuff. And so they get him to teach rabbinics. And he writes these wonderful books where he collects the uh, the response of different, um, uh, different communities. So you have the people who who built the... Uh, who He has a book called Bate Din Va'on Shehen, right? How courts uh, administered justice and punishment throughout... The post-Talmudic period. There's a whole book about how education was administered in different communities. And he also, uh, this is a picture of him as part of the Supreme Court of Israel. He's the only person who ever made it onto the Supreme Court of Israel without a law degree because they wanted somebody who knew Jewish law and the features of Jewish law and jurisprudence. And Simcha Saf was, was a professor at the Hebrew University and he knew that. So he became a professor here. But he writes a very important uh -huh. article on the Jews of Sfarad. It says, He's looking at Jewish response to literature. And what is what do we see in Jewish response to literature? It's actually broader than Jewish response to literature. There's some other rabbinic literature in there. What, what does it tell us about the life of the, of the um, converso? And he has some rather remarkable things to share with us. So first of all, he shares with us um, in the words of the Shevet Yehuda. Now, the Shevet Yehuda is not a piece of responsa. The Shevet Yehuda is sort of a collection of stories of perse persecution that is written by Rabbi uh, Shlomo Ibn Virga, who himself was a forced convert in pro Portugal. The story of the Portuguese Jews is different than the story of the um, than uh, than the Spanish Jews, and so Shevet, he lives. He's forcibly converted in the year 1497 in Portugal and manages to escape and then ultimately publishes this book in the Ottoman Empire. But this book has a collection of stories about Jews who have been um, forcibly converted throughout the whole Spanish and Portuguese experience. And he puts in the words of one of these oppressors, he says, no, he's a, this is the voice of the church elder. Now, it's clear, by the way, that the church elder is speaking like a Yid. Like, it reminds me of the joke... Um, that the uh, the Jew who goes to uh, to the country club and he fills out the country club application and his friend you know Beryl says to him so Yankel what did you put down when they said religion he said goyish um, right that's what the Jew writes when when uh, when the non-Jew asks him what is religion so this is this is written in a similar par parlance um, but we will see what he says he says no my king 
that the anusim, meaning the conversos, but anusim is a term means the forced converts. Now, Christians don't call Jews that. They would call them new Christians. They would call them, they might call them Moranos, but though that was a little bit more slang, but they would definitely not call them forced converts. So he says, no, my king, that the anusim served their first religion more after the oppression than before the oppression. Now, again, the reason this could not have been, been said by a church elder is because they don't generally refer to themselves as the oppressors. But what his point is, is that Jews took their religion more seriously. New Christians took their Jewish religion more seriously after this than before. So this seems to be fly in the face of, of, of Netanyahu. And I think what you have the way you have to understand this is that Netanyahu is telling you a picture of a portion of the people and and the sources that are going to be brought to bear by Simcha Asaf and also by Cecil Roth, they're going to give you a different picture. And neither one is wrong, but I think you have to look at these as, as subsections of the community. And as we know from the Jewish community, it's really hard to say any one thing about how everyone practices, because there's so many different ways that practice is is um, is taken. Okay, I'm going to... Um, uh, catching up on the chat. Um, um, okay, uh, so someone just backing up my comment on the Portuguese Jews. So, yes, okay. Now, um, oh, one more comment here. Um, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot to say about um, about Portugal, and that may be a future discussion. Okay. Now, fascinating. Also from the Shevet Yehuda. So he says, Amar Choker, Inquisador, Echad El Haduchus. He says to the Duke, Im ladat shomrim Shabbat. If you want to know how the Jew, which Jews are keeping Shabbat, let's go up on the city tower, maybe the church spire, right? Go look out, see, see, um, you know, Pedro de Franco's house. You see how all the other chimneys are smoking? It's, uh, it's cold outside, and everyone should have a fire in their fireplace. But Franco's house doesn't have it. Look at the other house. This house doesn't have it. Rabim. And there are many houses that had no smoke coming out of the ch chimney. And that's how you knew that the Jews were keeping Shabbos, right? Because anybody who didn't keep Shabbos, his chimney was silent, right? Now, again, this seems to be the evidence that a lot of people were doing their darndest to keep Shabbos. Cecil Roth has a has a an article where where he says it's called the religion of the Moranos, and he cites um, both in in the literature of the Inquisition and Hebrew literature that demonstrates that Jews kept Hebrew books, they had a knowledge of the Hebrew language. They kept kashrut to the extent possible. We'll see more about that later. And they even kept private synagogues in their homes. They also had a deep attachment. Um, I, I should say also, we have a case as late as 1538 of a Jew who was reported to the Inquisition because he refused to take money on Shabbos. Maybe somebody came to pay him back. Maybe somebody wanted to buy something from him. And they tried to put money in his hands and he wouldn't take it on Shabbos. So that's evidence of people who are really keeping their religion, right? If Netanyahu is telling us that everybody was swept into the fold, well, certainly not everybody. There's certainly people who are, who are keeping things. And it wasn't just Jewish law. There's also certain parts which were just custom. There, is, there was a custom amongst the conversos, amongst Jews of Spain, that when you sweep the house, you always sweep the mezuzah first. And you don't want to sweep past the mezuzah because that's disrespectful to the mezuzah. The normal way, normal people who don't have a mezuzah sweep back in the day is you sweep in the back of the room, out the door, right? You don't sweep the front first because you have to sweep it again when you take the, the, the dirt from the back of the room to the door. It doesn't make any sense. It's completely illogical. It's inefficient. But Jews want to give kavod to the mezuzah. And in order to do that, what do they do? They sweep the... Um, uh, they sweep this um, uh, the the mezuzah first, 
And so that's how you could, the inquisitors were able to tell that, uh, um, uh, that, that this was a Jewish house because they kept, these aren't laws. But, uh, Rabbi, wait, wait, yeah. where would they have the mezuzah? Surely the mezuzah would not be, you know, attached to the door from the lintel of the door. Uh, so, first of all, I, I, that, that's, that's an interesting question. I didn't see w where that was, but it is very possible that um, that this was just the way that they swept things. The, the, the memory of the mezuzah, the place the mezuzah used to be, right? Uh -huh. So that they're they're honoring this. Maybe they had it secretly put there. Maybe they sometimes put it, maybe they put it up at times and took it down, right? So there might be a number of ways to, to do this, right? Um, we also see in the 1530s, the Inquisition finds a Jew guilty of sending two of his brothers to the home of a Jew in Fez, Morocco. So that's that's where he sent them to learn to learn Torah, right? You know, we send our children off to Israel. But he he wanted his children to learn what it was like to live in a Jewish household. So he couldn't do it in 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 Spain. So he sent them to Fez. Um now there were also there were also some famous scenarios of religious rescue, meaning the Jewish communities around the world would send their, their um, uh, maybe rabbis, maybe former conversos, people had access to go back and try and bring Jews back to the fold, right? So in the records of the Inquisition, we have that, um, and this is based on a famous rabbi in Amsterdam, Rabbi Menashe ben Israel. Just to tell you a little bit about Menashe ben Israel, Rabbi Menashe ben Israel had a relationship with Rembrandt. And Rembrandt's famous painting of uh, Daniel and uh, Belshazzar, where the, where the hand is writing on the wall. So Menashe ben Israel was the one who gave Rembrandt the interpretation. So, and he's a very famous rabbi. He sort of orchestrates the return of the Jews to England. He's a, he's a, he's a big mover and shaker in Amsterdam. And so Menashe ben Israel, every year he would send Jews from Holland to the capital of Madrid, and they would circumcise these Jews, right? Now that's, you know, that is a, a, a remarkable, a remarkable thing. We will see that circumcision is going to be a very interesting subject. I'm not going to be able to finish circumcision today, but some of the, some of the aspects of circumcision are, are more interesting uh, as this history goes on so we're gonna it's gonna take us hundreds of years to see how this whole circumcision business uh comes comes about but he would they would send people there to go and circumcise um children and also to bring them back to the fold now, there's a very famous case here we're outside of spain we're in we're in brazil in 1647 now in brazil in that area that both the Dutch and the Portuguese have colonies. And there is a Jew by the name of Isaac de Castro. And he goes from Amsterdam to Brazil to teach Torah to the Anusim. Um, and he ultimately gets sent to Lisbon to, uh, to trial. But he has a very interesting story. So he goes um, to, um, and Amanda, you can correct me if I have bad pronunciation on any of these things. Um, um, so, um, and Amanda's recommending a, a book, The Hidden Star of Ser Sertao, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, about the Anusim in Brazil. Okay, let's, uh, let, well, I, I'm interested in hearing more about that later. So he arrives, so our hero, Isaac de Castro, arrives in, he arrives in, um, in Bahia, um, and he is denounced by someone to the bishop of Bahia, who is also, as it turns out, the chief of the Portuguese Portuguese Inquisition. So the the bishop's informant recognizes him because I guess he went to Minion or something in the morning. He puts on tefillin. He's like, wait, a minute, this guy's not a this guy's not who he says he's supposed to be. And he's bought, brought before the, the the bishop in 1644, and he tries to evade punishment. And he said, no, 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 I'm not that person. My name is. Jose de Liz. And yes, I was circumcised. I was a Jew born in France, but you know, I uh I I became enamored with Christianity and I learned all about Catholicism. Um 
but they don't really buy it. And they send him back to an ecclesiastical trial. And it, they send him back to trial in Lisbon. And he finally admits to his identity. And he says, you know, I, I was the son of Portuguese conversos that lived as Catholics outwardly. But when I, when my mother went to baptize me, she told her neighbor she would, she would babysit her baby. And instead of taking me into the baptismal font, she put the neighbor's baby in the baptismal font or something like that. She switched the babies. So he wasn't really truly baptized. And so he claims, well, you know, I'm free to practice Judaism um, without running afoul of the Inquisition. Um, and, um, but however, you know, in the end, uh, uh, there were others who, who um, testified against him. And um, they, they testified that he'd been properly baptized, a Catholic, and he was guilty of secretly practicing and proselytizing um, Judaism. And he was offered two choices. He was told that you can continue to deny Catholicism and then you'll be burned at the stake. Or you confess your errors, return to the church, the church um, and suffer a prison sentence that would be less than five years. And he, um, he would not give up Judaism and he would not embrace Catholicism. And he decided at the price of his life to perish and he sanctified, uh, he died as a as a martyr, um, and as the as the story goes, the last words that were heard on his mouth were the Shema Yisrael, over the taunts of of many other, um, uh, um, the, of of I guess um, either fans of the Inquisition or Jews who who needed to be able to profess their uh, their their fealty to the Catholic Church. Brit Mila. So we have a, a response from the Karen Shlomo, who said many of these Anusim, many of these forced converts, performed circumcision on themselves with their own hands because you could trust no one for fear that the matter would be revealed. So I would imagine that this was at a time when people had somewhat private um, bathrooms and, um, you know, this could be something you could keep relatively secret. There is a there is a testimony in a letter that is written by Shlomo Mocho. Shlomo Mocho, um, sorry, it's spelled wrong here. It says Shlomo Mocho, but it should be Shlomo Mocho. So Shlomo Mocho was a false messiah, but he writes to one of the leading rabbis of the time. This rabbi, Rabbi Yosef uh, Taitzak, is the rabbi of Rabbi Moshe Al Shich and Rabbi Shlomo Alkabetz. Shlomo HaLevi Alkabetz is famous for all of us. He writes the Chadodi. So this is the Rebbe. This is a letter written to the Rebbe of the author of the prayer that we sing every Friday night. L'chadodi. And what's in this letter? At night, I performed the circumcision and no one was with me. Shlomo Mocho talks about his own self-circumcision. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be He, for the sake of His name, assisted me and healed me, even though the suffering was great and I felt much pain and I fainted for the blood flowed the words are like a mayana mitkaber, the overflowing spring. The merciful one, the healer, healed me in a short time. Right? He faints. He's gushing blood. I don't know. Maybe he was at risk of exsanguinating. But he he circumcises himself. This is a, a, a true embrace of, of this mitzvah. And what I think it tells you is that, that there were many people who just could not leave Judaism. They had to keep things in secret, but they figured out a way to remain faithful to their Judaism at great personal, political, and health risks. Now, they did have to outwardly show that they were Christians, and they had various methods of, of sort of, uh, the, of, I guess, ballasting the cognitive dissonance that had to go about, right? You're a Jew at heart. You just circumcised yourself at home. You uh, you have all sorts of 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 guilt about this. So, you know, there are prayers that you say when you go into the Beit Hamidrash, when you go into the study hall. There are prayers that you say when when you leave the study hall. There are prayers when you say you go into the synagogue. Matov o'alecha Yaakov, how how beautiful are your tents, O Jacob. So 
there was a prayer that they would say when they would go into church, right? This is, by the way, the church of uh, San Juan de los uh, Panetes in Saragossa, which is in um, Castile. I figured I'd pick a church so we could imagine a place that they would walk into. And they would say, Moda I am I admit before you, God, that I have not come to this place to worship stone and wood. I'm going here so I can save my life, so I can, you know, I can daven shachras later at home, I can uh, keep the holidays later at home, but I'm doing this for you, God. I'm walking into this church for you, God. And there was a, a teaching. We have this in, in a responsa of one of the rabbis of the Devar Shmuel, Rabbi Shmuel Abuhav. So he says, the prohibition of idol worship is the service of the heart at the time when the external actions comply with the heart. But when the inside, the toho, and the outside, the boro, are inconsistent, and all the actions are just because of the fear of the non-Jew, one is exempt from the punishment of heaven. What does that mean? It means, here I'm giving you a rabbinic ruling. Yes, we know what you're doing. You guys have to fake Christianity. Yes, we know that. Don't worry. Hashem knows you're faking Christianity. There was a sort of an unwritten rule amongst this community. Yes, we know what you have to do. You have to fake Christianity. But that's, that's part of it. There was also a, an interesting phenomenon um, there was, um, there, there are, we, we know that the, con the conversos had a great um, veneration for, for those who were martyred. This is a picture of Lope de Vera, or Judah the Believer. He's referred to as Judah of the Believer by Spinoza. Right now, remember, Spinoza lives in Amsterdam, and he has his family as a family of, of refugees. But he has in his, his memory bank this individual. And we have, um, we have testimony from various um, youth and others who, who uphold these individuals as, like, as their Jewish heroes. Even though this was a Christian who saw the truth of Judaism and then was punished by the Inquisition, that's, that's all, um, I guess, it's not... Uh, um, it's not necessary for the person to have been born a Jew. Those who resist the forces of coerced Christianity become the heroes of this converso community. And so we, we see this sort of, this evidence that their heart remains very much in, in the Jewish fold, even though there's a very um, practiced external Christianity. Another example of this is we know that from a um, a, a, a tshuva of the Tashbeitz, Rabbi Shmuel Tzemach of Doron, important commentary. He says, but before weddings in a church, they would they would have a proper chuppah, right? And you got to love my little graphics here. I'm very proud of them. Um, <laughs> anyway, he says, Lefishu, and he says that that the Jewish communities outside of Spain had to accept them as kosher. Now, this is fascinating. Why would they accept them as kosher? Why are these kosher conversions? I, I'm sorry, kosher weddings. The, the, the witnesses there had to be other conversos, right? These are people who are eating the wafer and the wine, right? They're crossing themselves. They're genuflecting, right? They may even be violating Shabbos. So you can't be a Shabbos violator and be a witness to a wedding. So the answer is, he writes, these people, even though they violate the Sabbath, even though they genuflect, even though they eat the wafer and the wine, and even though they, they go to Mass and um, all those other things, they are going, he's going to consider them kosher witnesses because their heart has been given over to heaven. That is a remarkable, remarkable tshuva. That takes guts. I would never have the the uh, the strength to be able to say something like that, because it flies in the face of so much standard Jewish law. But it still uh, it shows there was tremendous veneration from Jews outside of 
Spain and Portugal for Jews who were living the secret life inside Spain and Portugal. A question, Rabbi? Yeah. If I may. I mean, does it fly in the face of, of what we understand a lot to be? We, we know that the, I think it's a, a debate, the guys who break Shabbos to drive uh, ambulances on Shabbos, they, don't we hold that they're not breaking Shabbos because what they're doing is yeah, correct. saving we do, a life? We do not, not yes, yeah, correct, correct. We do not think that the Hotel drivers are breaking Shabbos. So isn't that the same thing here? We surely shouldn't think that these guys are breaking halacha because they're doing this for the sake of saving a life. So, uh, you know what? I have to look up the full argumentation of the Tash Bates, um to be 100% certain of that. But his language is very interesting because he says it's because their heart is given to heaven. So, uh -huh. so that 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 you're you're correct maybe in in any postsec probably writes you know five different arguments and that could be part of it without a question so we'll we'll leave that as as a possibility but still yeah. it, it, you know cuz what's the harm of telling them to get married again do another marriage keep it safe but he he wanted to say no this is kosher now, here's some interesting things. Passover was the most celebrated holiday. And we have a fascinating tshuva. The fascinating tshuva is from Rabbi Shlomo ben Shimon. He said that they would put, he told them, put the flour in boiling water. Because once you boil the flour, technically it can't become chametz any, anymore because it's been cooked. So you can't, you can't be machmitz after something's been cooked, um, and so, uh, so they would they would uh, um, they would boil it, and then they could make bread out of it, and and it looks like they're eating chametz, but really it's kasher lepesach. Um, this will seem not so novel to us because we do this all the time, but this is very novel then, um, because first of all, you have to know a little bit about the history of matzahs, until maybe. 150 years ago, all matzahs were soft. They were baked right before Pesach, and they're kind of made like a, a lafa. And it was a much more pleasant experience. The crispy matzah is a modern phenomenon. It's done because they, they started making matzahs in in fact in industrial contexts, and then it has they start making the matzahs before Purim. If you're going to make matzah before Purim, and you want it to stay... Uh, um, you want to be mold free by the time you get to Pesach, you're going to bake it at 900 degrees and it's going to be crispy and burnt. And then once you do that, then you can grind it up and you can make matzah meal and cake meal and all sorts of other things that don't necessarily make the most appetizing breads. But he told them, make your matzahs maybe a couple months before Pesach and then grind them up. And it, there's a special kind of cake, I don't know, that the Spanish called uh, car Karshpilash. Um, I, it, it was written in Hebrew, so I'm not sure I got the pronunciation 100% correct. And grind them up, make flour, make bread. This is this is our matzah meal. Now, there was one rabbi who said, look, you know, if you can't do either of those, so you can have matzah ashira. Make your bread with, with wine. Make your bread with milk. And then, you know, it's not technically chametz either. And so you can get away with it. So th There was one Jew who's reported to never have... In, in eating chametz all year round, so that you could get away with eating, um, with keeping kosher lepesach. So he just didn't eat bread. He said, "I'm celiac." Before it had been invented, obviously, or discovered. So you you get this uh, this, and we even as late as the 16th century, there's a doctor from Amsterdam who um, who who was expelled from Spain, and he tells the story of going to the market in Toledo, and seeing the servant buy, you know. The, the 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 various vegetables that would have been traditional for the Seder plate. And he knew right away your your master is Jewish, that these things were, were taking place all along. Um, um okay so I see somebody saying my family just avoided eating bread the week before Easter, but they didn't know that for, for why they did that. That's for another reason. 
Um, oh, bread. Interesting. Okay, that's very interesting. Okay, wow. So there's th some of these things still come today. Okay, so um, sort of one thing which I think is just sort of an interesting observation. Cecil Roth said, Jews went from being infidels outside the church to being heretics within the church. And the church had a really big problem because now they had all these converts and they had, a, they had an internal problem. And we can see, we can see the origins of the Inquisition just starting to, to, to kindle. The, you know, the flames of the Inquisition are just, just starting to flicker just a little bit. Um, so I want to do one thing. Last time we had this whole discussion about, should I call them Moranos, Conversos, um, uh, Anusim, what name should we use? So, um, and I thought it was it would be fitting to end with what's in the name, because I didn't want to distract us at the beginning. So the name Marano, some people say it comes from the words marit marit ayin, which means to be deceptive of the eye, which is a Talmudic term. Maranos, which means a person who would it's Talmudic for a person who was who was uh, um, was forced into conversion. Um, mechoram ata. Right, you are you are excommunicated, um, but these are probably not true because the term Murano does not appear in any of the Jewish literature, and it's just not used amongst the Jews. So that means that it probably didn't come from any Judaic language. Um, um, some people say it comes from Anathema Maran Maranatha, which was an ecclesiastical curse, but Roth Cecil Roth doesn't think that that's the right one either. Uh, it could come from the Arabic word, which is murain, which means a hypocrite, possibly. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, oh, there's, before I get to the last one, let me just, my favorite one is that the name might, there was a name for the Muranos called Alboraikos, which comes from Alburak, which was Muhammad's horse, which was neither horse nor nor mule, it was not male nor female, not fish nor fowl, right? You're not really Jews, you're not really Christian. So that's my favorite name for all of this because that probably describes it best. They will uh, alboraikos, but going back to uh, to Murano. So Murano is an old Spanish term for swine. And so one version of this is that it's a reference to the fact that the, that the Jews did not eat pork and it expresses the hatred of the Spanish to these insincere neophytes right why it, it but it's just it's an amazing thing that possibly it it transferred from people who don't eat pork to being called um swine so that's a very interesting um a very interesting thing should we use the term so this is cecil roth's uh final um he uses it all. He uses it in the titles of his books and his articles. He's got a book called um, "The Moranos of Spain." He's got an article which is called uh, "The Religion of the Moranos." He uses it all over the place, and he says it is the constancy shown by them and their descendants that has redeemed the term from its former insulting connotation and endowed it with its enduring power of romance. Uh, so I, I kind of like this, you know, that uh, Cecil Roth, you know, has this sense that this became a term of pride uh, and and that we can use it. And he was one of the leading scholars of, of the Muranos in general. Now, I, he did not live in the age of full political correctness. You know, he's writing this in 1932, um, but I think there's still a, uh, 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 there is something that is true about how this is a really, and we've seen the sort of the heroic sacrifice of a lot of these a lot of these Jews. So what's coming up? What's coming up for us is the following. Um, we have to look at the Moranos after 1492, because after 1492, you know, there was there were certainly scenarios where they would go to weddings, they would go to things with with their Jewish neighbors, depending on how fierce the anti-Semitism was at the time. Um, and so but after 1492, there are no Jews around. And that's one of the reasons they expel the Jews from Spain is because they they can't, they figure they cannot get the, the conversos, the Moranos to be really good Christians unless they get rid of the Jews. And so there's a whole new uh, sort of phenomenon and, and, and 
sort of culture to that Jewish community after 1492. So we need to look at that. Um, we also have to look at how did the rest of the Jewish community accept them when they went to Amsterdam and Salonika and Sfat and all of that. What, what was that like? And then, um, you know, what was their social status like? Where did they go from there? What was the origin, the practice, the effects of the Inquisition on them? So I want to sort of look at each one of those things. And I, I, I have to tell you, I found this a fascinating story. Uh, hopefully you have found it equally uh, interesting um, as I have. Um, I'm really, really uh, excited that uh, there are a couple of people from from um, uh, of Portuguese heritage uh, and I would I would love to be able to dig de uh, dig down into this a little bit more because we now have a we're starting to have a larger community from from uh, Brazil in uh, um, uh, yeah and I see Sylvia writing please go back to Portugal too it's very important yes um, Portugal 1497 is has its own unique phenomenon a whole its own unique story and we certainly should take a stop there and understand Portugal. And uh, a lot of the things, by the way, uh, a lot of the um, the information that we have come from Jewish communities that were colonies of, of Spain and Portugal, uh, of which, you know, Brazil um, was one. Now I'm forgetting um, where um, there's a wolf wrote. Now hold on a second. There's just trying to remember. Um, uh, the Jews of the, in the Canary Islands. Uh, I don't know if the Canary Islands were Spanish or Portuguese, if anyone knows. But um, so, but you know, we we have information about these uh, these Jews from from places like the Canary Islands. So um, this is a um, it's a really it's it, it's a topic of great heroism. It has a lot of I think interesting overlap with with you know, a, a culture which is dominant. Um, uh, so, uh, and again, I thank our uh, our Jews of, of uh, Brazilian slash Portuguese descent for being part of this.